bytwowayradios.com. Check, check. Bytwowayradios.com. It's the Two Way Radio Show. And welcome to the Two Way Radio Show. I'm Rick Savoya. And I'm Danny Feimster. And this is the podcast about two-way radios for business and consumer communications. Today, we'll discuss the question of how much control a GMRS repeater operator can have over the use of their private repeater on a GMRS repeater channel. We'll also take some of your comments and questions from our blog and our forum at twowayradioforum.com. Our show is sponsored by by twowayradios.com, the source of two-way radios and radio accessories for businesses and consumers since 2002. By twowayradios.com, your radio specialists. Recently, I overheard an exchange on a local GMRS repeater between the owner of the repeater and a newly licensed GMRS operator who was using it. Although the new operator did not violate any of the FCC rules, he apparently did break one set by the owner of the repeater as a condition for using it. This piqued my interest because it was a rule that was unknown even to me. It brought a question to my mind about the use of repeaters, particularly those that are privately owned or closed to the public that operate on uh, what are otherwise considered public GMRS repeater channels. The question I had was, is it just me, or is there something wrong with this picture? What do you think's wrong with the picture? That I'm there's sure. two levels of rules? Is that is that the issue, that you've got rules being set by repeater owners and you've got FCC rules, so there, there's you don't think that should be the case? Well, I'll tell you what, to... Um, be more specific about what uh, I encountered. Let me go ahead and recount the particular incident, and then uh, we can we can go from there. Yeah, tell us tell us what you heard. What spurred your uh, okay. intrigue here? Well, uh, just very recently, I was out one night walking my dog, and I had the KG 935G Plus with me as I use the flashlight on it to find her business. And, and then while I'm walking around, it's so that I have something to listen to at night uh, while I'm out and about. And I turned it on to a local repeater and I heard a conversation between a guy and his wife while he was en route home. No big deal. The thing is they were speaking in Spanish. Now, I thought this was interesting and actually somewhat refreshing because it was an instance of someone using radios for something other than radio checks and talking about their antennas, which is what I usually hear on these repeaters mm -hmm. uh, at all hours of the day. <laughs> so I, I didn't really understand the, the conversation pretty much, but uh, I, I was just passively listening in. And after they were done talking, the owner of the repeater uh, just came on and asked the guy uh, to only speak in English when on his repeater. And, and he was nice about it. He, he was totally nice about it, and, you know, but he was firm about that rule. Well, the guy apologized and explained that he was just talking to his wife and they were just using their call sign. And... Um, and he was new to explain that he was new to GMRS and, and he, he was uh, pretty much on the repeater, I guess, more or less for the first time. And so the owner said, no, you know, OK, and even invited them both to their weekly net, which I sometimes listen to when I'm out walking the dog during that time. But he was emphatic about the rule on his repeater. Um, requiring everyone to speak English only uh, and, and as a requirement for using it. And I get it. I mean, that, I totally get it. You know, it's his repeater, his rules. That's fine. Well, uh, the thing is, after they were done, I called into the repeater owner on the radio and just asked him if, if I heard him correctly about this rule and that I was not aware there was such a rule about speaking English only. 
And he told me that he wasn't sure if there was any such FCC rules for GMRS, but it was his rule on his repeater. And I said, okay, you know, it's your repeater. That's good. And I, I thanked him and I, I signed off. Well, when I got back to the house, I got back in the house and I started thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, I was thinking, you know, something, I don't know, it just something that kind of bugged me about about this whole thing. And I thought that it was something I, I just didn't really think about before. So, uh, so I Googled it up and I even found a whole Reddit thread on it. And the, pretty much uh, as far as I could find, there is no rule uh, on GMRS that says that, that you can't speak in any language other than English. So it kind of feels to you like the rules that repeater owners are placing directly uh, over and above the FCC rules is a little much. You, it kind of feels like we should have one set of rules that the FCC sets, and that should be the set of rules that everyone goes by. Is that, is that the feeling that... You know, I'm not 100% sure what it is, but there's something about it that just seems a little, I don't know... Uh, I, I guess the question is how much power does a GMRS repeater owner have to control uh, speech on this on on a private repeater, and or a pub or you know what's called an open repeater? I mean, there's there's no rule about not using foreign languages about on GMRS. I I, I went through the uh, rules and it really doesn't say that, and. Uh, if they if he wanted to have his own rule on there about that, you know, I mean, that's fine since he owns the repeater. But it does bring up an interesting discussion on this, um, and and it can it can go in several directions here. First of all, can a repeater owner really enforce that kind of rule if if the person on the repeater is uh, complying with all the other FCC rules? I mean, if there's no FCC rule against it. Um, and the repeater owner puts his own rules on top of it, um, can the owner really enforce his rules, um, maybe, I, I wouldn't say that supersede the FCC rules, but that are in addition to the FCC rules? And if so, if they can enforce it, how far can they go with it? And would there be a point where it becomes, I don't know, discriminatory? And uh, what, what about the open repeaters? I mean, you know, private repeaters, I get that. But an open repeater that's public, you know, um, maybe maybe there's a little more latitude there. I'm not exactly sure. I think you could come up with some scenarios that, that I'm just making up off the top of my head that might push the limits a little. Like, say, for example, a repeater owner wanted to say, I'm only allowing primary call sign holders mm -hmm. to operate on my repeater. You, you uh, if you are the niece of a license holder, you, you're not allowed. You have to have your own call sign. You can't use someone else's call sign that that covers you. So maybe that would be a little iffy. But I, I, I do tend to fall in the if you own the repeater, you can do whatever you want. I think it's easiest. If, if that is the way it goes, where the repeater owner can do whatever they like, otherwise you're opening a huge can of worms. But you, you bring up a good point with the enforcement. I have a lot of enforcement questions. And I think because enforcement isn't really possible with a lot of this. So say, for example, the, the gentleman continued to, to speak Spanish. What could really be done about it by a repeater owner? Just because they're limited in what they can do for enforcement, mm -hmm. I think that restricts the type of rules that can be put in place anyway and kind of incentivizes um, a very low number of rules. Mm -hmm. um, Public-private is another interesting thing that you, you brought up. Like, what, What's the difference between a public-private re repeater? Are, are we saying a public repeater is one where the repeater owner is allowing saying anyone can access my repeater. You don't have to have permission first. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's much of a distinction because you still have someone that's paying for the repeater, maintaining the repeater. So whether it's technically 
public or private, whether you have to ask permission first or not, you still, you know, the repeater owner can can take his repeater and go home at the end of the day if you make him mad yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, he could he could turn it off and and shut it down. That that's what he could do in an extreme situation. But but let's say if you're if you're on the repeater and you have the and I know on the private repeaters they you ask permission and they say okay or not. And if they say okay, then then you're granted the the uh, CTCSS or DCS code or whatever to to access the repeater. But um, you know, if some if they decided to block somebody from the repeater, how is that usually done? I don't know. I don't own a repeater. I'm not a repeater owner. Uh, if they decided they were going to going to revoke that, what do they do? Change the DCS code or CTCS code for everyone else and and uh, just block him from getting on. I'm sure there are some repeater owners who could chime in and 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 tell us exactly how they do that, how they do that blocking and restrictive uh, restrictive access. Yeah, I don't really think that there's a way to like, foolproof on an analog repeater. Mm -hmm. You have a lot more capabilities with digital. With yeah, EMR, yeah, absolutely, but, you do. Uh, but with an analog system, CTCSS or DCS tones are generally the way that traffic is screened and knowing that tone is the what gets you into the, the repeater but it's it's really not hard to figure out mm -hmm. what those tones are and and making a change to a tone is a big step because you, if you've got a lot of repeater users mm -hmm. you have to let everyone know that you're doing it otherwise people aren't getting into the repeater and it's kind of a hassle for them to figure out what the, the tone is yeah and if they can discover the tone, then the person you're trying to keep out that's, can that's, certainly discover the tone too. That's true. That's absolutely true. So you have that issue of just how much control they have over blocking someone off the repeater. But there's also the matter of control as far as enforcing the rules and enforcing their own rules that go beyond the FCC rules. If someone is abiding by all of the FCC rules, uh, and we could go in through and read some of them. Uh, you know, I I searched around, I could not find. Now, here's here's what I did find uh, on, on one of the Reddit threads, which was a few years old. I found a link to an old uh, version of the Part 95 rules that pretty much said that you can speak as long as you know, as long as it's regular language, you can't you can't speak in code uh, except for ten codes. Uh, you can't speak in a coded language, but as long as you were as long as you were speaking in a human language, and they it said specifically at the time that it can be a foreign language. Uh, it's just just any any regular human uh, language, language of human speech. Uh, you could you know it was perfectly fine. And uh, when I checked the latest version of the rules, and, and I'm actually looking at, let me see, I have a copy of it right here. Permissible GMRS uses, this is in 95.1731, and this is the, the, the uh, paragraph uh, uh, before they get into the A, B, C, D sections. It says the operator of a GMRS station may use that station for two-way plain language voice communications with other GMRS stations and with other FRS units concerning personal or business activities. And it just says plain language voice communications, which my understanding is plain language means any language as long as it's not a coded language. It doesn't have to be English. It could be Spanish or, or you know, Chinese or Japanese or French or Italian or, or any other language. Yeah, it, seems, speak it seems clear to me that there's nothing in the rules that say that you you have to be speaking English. So that's, that's clearly an, a, a rule that that repeater owner had set up. Now, there is one caveat to the rules, and that comes down later as far as the call signs are concerned. And uh, scrolling down here, where it says uh, under 95.1751, uh, paragraph B, it says the call sign must be transmitted using voice in the English language or international Morse code uh, telegraphy using an audible tone. And all that's talking about is just the call sign. That's it. Um, and I can understand the reason for that because the call sign being a universal uh, marker or a universal badge, I guess, of, of who you are, 
uh, an identification of who you are that does need to be in one language that everybody can pretty much understand. And English being more of a universal language, uh, that's what it has to be uh, given in. But the rest of everything else doesn't have to be. That's my understanding. Yeah, I, I uh, concur. I, I think we still have the problem, though, of like, let's say, uh, like, it clearly says in the rules that the uh, call sign must be transmitted at the beginning of a transmission or every 15 minutes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that is an FCC rule. Mm -hmm. Let's say someone is on the repeater and they don't transmit their call sign. It, you still have the same enforcement problem with that clearly accepted and valid FCC rule mm -hmm. that you would have with your um, your rule that's created by the repeater owner only, like the English rule. Mm -hmm. Um, so enforcement is really the issue. And all these rules, none of this is even an issue if everyone behaves like adults. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I think the problem that you have is some people behave like children and they get on a repeater and they break the rules and they see that, oh, the, when I break the rules, it gets other people on this repeater upset. And then they like that. It's it's troll behavior. Or, or it causes more people to say, hey, I can break the rules too. And then you've got mayhem all over the repeater. So I totally understand that. I mean, there, there need to be some rules in place and particularly on a private repeater, you know, because ultimately the repeater owner is ultimately, I guess, in a way liable to the FCC uh, for that. Because we're talking about a GMRS repeater here that's using the call sign of, of the owner of that station. And uh, it, it is important that they have some controls, some rules in place to make sure that they're not getting in trouble with the FCC for something. So I totally understand that. But that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, beyond the FCC rules. If, is, if everyone's following the FCC rules and there are no violations, how far can the repeater owner go uh, to, to establish their own set of rules? And what happens if there are rules that they've established that violate, maybe violate someone else's uh, uh, right to be on the air totally? I don't really know what the um, official FCC position on this is, and, and I don't think one is defined. I think that as it's set right now, a repeater owner can set whatever rules they like. Mm -hmm. And um, I agree with that. I think that it's the way that it should be. I think that if, if a repeater owner is making uh, terrible rules and making it using their repeater a, a horrible experience for, for everyone, then people shouldn't use that repeater. People should just move on mm -hmm. to another repeater. Now, you, you do run into issues with we only have eight repeater frequencies in yeah. GMRS. And we're going to we're going to touch on that more so, in, a, in a few minutes because that that is a, a almost that's almost a separate topic entirely. But that is an important aspect of that. But what? Yeah. So if you're in an area, where, a, a congested area where there's eight repeaters, all the frequencies are being taken up, then that may limit you if if all of the repeaters are enforcing mm -hmm. rules that you don't like. But I mean, if if that were the case, you might need to look at yourself. Well. I once again, I totally understand. You know, certain topics, certain things that that people can't talk about, like no politics or religion on the repeater, that sort of thing. I, you know, that I fully understand because that can cause a lot of uh, and, and that causes a lot of trouble. Uh, ultimately, I think everybody understands that. So, you know, if you have a rule place in place in the repeater that says no politics or religion discussions. I have no issue with that. You know, I'll keep it above board, keep everybody friendly and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, that issue that you brought up earlier about whether the repeater owner could say that they're only allowing the primary owner of the call sign and not relatives, where it's totally okay for other relatives to use uh, the call sign because they're all licensed. They're all in – they all – are licensed as part of that license uh, from the uh, from the main the primary owner of that license. So when you're excluding them, I think that kind of approach is a gray area. But still, I can see where there might be circumstances where that might be necessary to enforce. 
I, I, I get that. But when... how about this analogy? Um, let's say you have a driver's license, mm -hmm. right? You have a car, say you have a, a teenage son who is learning to drive and he's got a driver's license. The, the state has said this individual is legal to drive. Mm -hmm. You own a car. Your son wants to borrow the car, but you make a rule that says you are not going to drive over 55 miles an hour in this car. Even though you're going on an interstate that allows 70 miles an hour, mm -hmm. there's not a problem with that, right? That would make sense. That does make sense. Uh, and, and, and it makes sense, especially if it's breaking other uh, rules such as speed laws, you know. But even so, yeah. Uh, that's kind of a, a safety enforcement rule uh, placed on by the the owner of the vehicle. But then we kind of get into, I mean, they're not, those things I understand, but then we kind of get into uh, some murky areas like, okay, what if uh, certain individuals because of, you know, and, and, and I'm talking about areas where it becomes protected under uh, well, un under the laws that we have in place uh, to avoid discrimination, you know, what if if there are, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this, but I think everyone can use their imaginations. What if the repeater on owner says, um, no, you can only be on the repeater if you're this type of person uh, or if you uh, are from this country or, or that uh, you you have uh, a certain ethnic background. You can or can't be on the repeater, uh, and and that starts to get into the area where now you're kind of encroaching on someone's uh, rights, as you know, individual rights, and uh, that that's where I think that's where it could be a problem. I guess, but I mean, it, it would be really hard to enforce rules like that uh, on a two-way radio repeater on GMRS, right? Because like, let's say, um, for, let's get specific with your example. Let's say you may, a repeater owner said, only U.S. citizens are allowed on mm -hmm. my repeater. Um, you've got a bigger enforcement problem. What are you going to ask for the passport of everyone that <laughs> you grant access to? Yeah. And if, if it's uh, like race or ethnicity or something else you're looking at, it, how do you know? You're on the radio. How do you... It's difficult to sure enforce that sure. anyway. And once again, when we're talking about things like, okay, yeah. you can't, you you can't. But if let's say legally, would it be illegal to say that? That's a good question. Because I mean, now you're getting into discrimination. So and and those things are protected by by federal law. So, um, and, and once again, what, what if you said men only, no women allowed on this repeater? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, it comes under gender. So, um, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, that could be, that could be problematic. I mean, a, a, could a restaurant do that? Some restaurants do, whether they can or not. <laughs> Apparently I've seen that happen. And as some restaurants do, but we're not really talking about restaurants here, though. We're talking specifically about private repeaters and, or privately owned repeaters. So if someone owns their own repeater, who can they restrict access to? Uh, who can they block? Uh, you know, how far can they go with it? Uh, you know, if you if there is speech that's allowed, I mean, obviously, you know, there are rules against obscenities and advertising, uh, you know, that that's not considered regulating free speech in the sense that there are specific rules in place by the FCC that you can't do that. But everything else that that that's allowed, um, you know, how how far can repeater owners take it? In my opinion, I think that there are no limits. I think that if you own a repeater, Whatever rules you want to set are the rules. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're limited by your ability to enforce those rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that enforcement is limited. So 
if you try to set a lot of rules, you're inviting trolls. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you may regret it, but I, I don't think there, there should be any legal um, restrictions on it. No. Now, I, I, I would like people to comment if, if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, I have not. Absolutely. I, I, let me warn everyone. I have not. Don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> I've not done a lot of research into this. Rick uh, heard a conversation. We thought it would be an interesting topic. So I don't know what the, what the FCC would do in this case or what the law is in this case, but uh, it's a fun topic. Well, you know, you brought it up when we were talking about this the other night. And you brought up this scenario. Let's say, for instance, that um, someone was talking in Spanish or another foreign language, which is perfectly okay, uh, according to the FCC rules, but the repeater owner didn't like it, and he had a rule against it. So they're talking in, in another language, let's say Spanish, and the repeater owner uh, doesn't like it, asks them to stop, and they still don't stop. And then there might be a situation where they, they find it difficult to block this person. Um, so the repeater owner, what's your next uh, step? Uh, if they call the FCC and said someone keeps talking in Spanish, even though I've asked him to stop, what's the FCC going to tell them? Well, I'm, you know, I, 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 they're pretty much going to say there's nothing they can do because uh, Spanish is legal on GMRS. So what can the repeater owner right. really do? There, there's no recourse that involves going to the FCC if you're making up your own rules for your repeater. Yeah. I mean, not that the FCC is doing a lot of enforcement anyway, but it's completely out of the question that the FCC would, would step in and help you as a repeater owner complaining about someone violating a rule that you set mm -hmm. that's over and above the FCC rules. Now, let's um, jump back for a second uh, talking about the open versus private repeaters, because up to this time, really our conversation has been about repeat, private repeater owners, people who've built their own machines, they pay for it, they 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 operate it, and it's all their expense, and they, they set their own rules. But what if it is a public or, or what's known as an open repeater? I mean, can those, can those managing an open repeater make and enforce rules outside what is allowed by the FCC? And if so, how far can they go? Because we're talking about public now. I absolutely think they, they're the same scenario. I, I think that the distinction between a public and a private repeater um, is really non-existent. The, the, what's the difference? It's, it's just if you're a public repeater, you're published in a directory along with a note that says you don't have to ask for permission first. But that repeater is still owned by an individual or a club. Mm -hmm. So what if it's owned by a 501 C three company that's publicly that that's, that's, that's a public 501 C three, not a private one, but a public then, one. Then, then they get to make the rules. Well, yeah, perhaps, but, uh, that gets us into, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, conversation about, well, is the repeater, really uh, just a repeater or could it be considered a type of social media platform? Because, I mean, basically it is. And when you're talking about social media platforms, um, you know, and um, yeah, I, I, we're getting a little off topic there, but a lot of the social media uh, platforms, with the exception of just a few, are actually public. They're publicly traded companies. So, and they do make their own rules but they still have to um, follow some certain rules, you know, as, or they have to abide by some uh, certain uh, elements of, of free speech and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I do see, I hadn't thought of that example before, but I, I do oddly see some parallels between the two because I believe there's um, a specific law or a section, I can't think of the number right now, but it's pretty popular that allows social media companies and forums and things like this to not be responsible for the content that users make on those platforms. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a platform and just anyone can come and post and they post something illegal, it's not really on the site owner. It's, it's the individual that's posting it that's responsible, even though that owner uh, of the site is, um, I guess, technically controls the data and they, you know, mm -hmm the platform. So interesting, interesting. That's, stuff. that's similar. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Enough. But that brings us into uh, the 
area that you started to cover earlier, and I think it's a really, really important um, thing to consider, and that is the fact that the GMRS airways themselves are public airways. I mean, the GMRS, as you said earlier, is comprised of only eight repeater channels. That's all we've got, eight, eight channels, and they're using these designated UHF frequencies uh, for, for GMRS. All of them are public, and they, ha they must be shared. They have to be shared. Under normal operation, no one GMRS user has exclusive right to any of them. And that includes repeaters, public or private. And uh, the thing is that until, like, say, five or six years ago even, this wasn't even really an issue because – and it's still not an issue in, in areas that are somewhat remote because, uh, you know, there aren't very many repeaters around. But this recent explosion in the number of GMRS operators uh, over the past few years – has brought with it an increase in the number of repeaters, all vying for the same, it's the same eight repeater channels. And there are some places, and I know I've talked, you know, I've, I've, I've read a lot of these uh, posts from from people in those areas, and I've talked to people uh, about this. That there are some areas, and our area where we are in is one of them. I think I talked to a gentleman the other day who was who who brought this up. There are some areas where there are so many repeaters within that area that they are starting to overlap and step over one another in certain cases. So, uh, in a case like that, who has the uh, who has the authority to to be the the, the one repeater that rules them all in that area and who and, and calls the shots for that repeater channel there, I don't believe there really is an authority um, that decides that right now right now um, you're just uh, it's the individual re, uh, the individual users and repeater owners have to coordinate amongst themselves and make sure they're not interfering and 99 percent of the time that that goes very very well mm -hmm. um, and that's similar to the system that uh, amateurs have. Mm -hmm. So the, the FCC is not saying, or a frequency coordinator is not saying an amateur, oh, you want to put up a repeater? Here's the frequency that you use. But in amateur, there are so many available yeah. frequencies yeah. A lot that more they don't really available. have this, this issue. There, there's more frequencies than there are people looking to put up repeaters. And that's not the case in GMRs. Exactly. I, I think that exactly. I think we'll probably see some pressure on the FCC to make changes to GMRS to um, to fix this, to allow more repeater frequencies. So I mean, maybe sometime around 2040, we'll see a, a change because <laughs> so, they, they move uh, glacially slow <laughs> over there. So, so basically, what is the answer? Is that the answer? Is that, I mean, I think that's probably the only answer going forward, but there might be some other ideas out there to, to resolve some of this. I mean, with all this explosive growth, in the GMRS, is it time, as you said, for the FCC to maybe reevaluate the service and kind of uh, say, hey, let's uh, – because, yeah, I mean, the GMRS was just um, – you know, the, the GMRS rules were just um, changed uh, a couple of years ago for for the what the second, third, fourth time. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I've been losing count here. But – um, is it time for the FCC to go in there again and say, hey, you know, we've got to, we, we, we may need to update the GMRS rules again. And this time we have to look at it at, and maybe focus on this specific area of it. Is it time for that? Maybe I think it's, it's past time for that. I think they should be thinking about that. I, I don't think they are thinking about that at this point, but I think that they should be. As far as what their options are, they, um, you have you can add more frequencies, mm -hmm. but if you add more frequencies, you're going to have to take them away from another service. And it's I already crowded. <laughs> GMRS bumps right into LMR, yep. so if if you are going to expand, then you have to give tons of notice, and you have to. It, it's a real mess yeah. because you're taking frequencies away from people that have a license for those frequencies. Um, you can also, and this is probably the easiest thing, is to do something like 
change the rules to only allow narrow band instead of wide band. I knew you were going now, to mention that. <laughs> that. That would double. Uh, yes. That would double your frequencies. But then you that brings its own problems because you have all this equipment that's out there now that uses wide band. So there'd be a long period of time where people are getting stepped on. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't be neat and clean either. You, you could also enable digital mm -hmm. like services like DMR on GMRS, where you could add a lot more slots and you know, things like this, but that complicates the service. And then it messes with people that are uh, listening on analog. If you're listening on your, your regular GMRS radio and someone starts using a digital radio, you're not going to be able to understand them. You got the problem that the CV guys have now where FM is allowed, um, whereas older equipment was only AM. So I, I guess we see the FCC is willing to do things like that. Well, perhaps. I mean, they, they can, I guess, well, it's still not an easy thing. I mean, maybe change the rules a little bit for more fair play between the repeaters on the existing channels, especially the ones in the crowded areas, maybe. I don't know how that would be accomplished. But other than um, what another you option. Well, you have another option. Uh, <laughs> uh, another <laughs> option. Uh, not a great option, but... Um, Another option would be start from scratch, sort of, put another service together in another part of the band altogether, 800, 900 megahertz, something like this, maybe down in the low fours, um, put another service together there with the same rules as GMRS, but then everyone has to buy new equipment. And, and what happens to the old GMRS radios? Uh, that, that That's a problem in itself. I don't know. I mean, the FCC... So there's a lot of overlap with FRS now. So yeah, maybe they yeah. could just say that this is the ban for FRS type stuff. Or maybe they leave it alone. We have a GMRS 1 and a GMRS... Or, or, or maybe <laughs> another complete, completely different segment of bandwidth is... a. Uh, or maybe like maybe another part of GMRS with the same rules. It's just expanded. Maybe open it it's, up to a VHF, uh, you know, for for MERS. Maybe open MERS up a little bit, uh, you know, because um, GMRS is getting getting that crowded. And and let's face it, uh, uh, the ham radios have VHF and UHF frequencies they can go to. Uh, GMRS doesn't really have that. They're just stuck on the, the, the one little sliver of the, the UHF band and uh, maybe allowing some of that, uh, maybe opening up MERS a little bit might, uh, might help. I don't know. I think MERS is limited by the, the two watts. Oh, but that's they, what I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah, about that, uh, 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 opening up MERS. That's what I mean when I'm saying opening up MERS, maybe, maybe changing the rules on MERS. Maybe it's time to do that. Allow repeaters? Uh, possibly. Bring it on. Maybe maybe up the wattage a little bit and bring on repeaters. You know, things like that. Give give MERS a little more access that GMRS currently has. I don't really think it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's really going to hurt anything. Uh, you know, on especially on the MERS side and VHF, but I might be completely wrong. I don't work for the FCC. So, I have, someone I, I will know. tell you that that's going to, someone will tell you that it's going to hurt something. Yeah. I, I promise. If you ask. <laughs> Somebody but always gets like, hurt somewhere. No, yes. Something. Yeah, it's going to be. Uh, uh, I would like to hear from our audience. If anybody has any suggestions on, you know, maybe uh, a way to expand GMRS, what's something I'm not thinking of. Send your comments to show at buy radios.com. And if we use your comments on the show, you might even win some swag. Well, we have some comments and questions from our blog and our forum at twowayradioforum.com. The first one comes from Aaron, and Aaron says, We just started using Motorola CLP1080E at work, and the earpiece is incredibly annoying to have in to hear broadcasts, and I haven't found a direct way to turn that into something that doesn't have to sit in my ear. A compatible, more traditional radio would be ideal with a speaker. It seems the CLS 1110 might be compatible. Any other manufacturers or models that would work with the CLP 1080? And that's from Aaron. Uh, well, that's an easy one. Yeah, the um, CLS, uh, or the CLP series is a two-watt business radio, and that's going to be compatible with 
um, from Motorola. She's right. CLS 1110, CLS 1410. Um, there are uh, also RD, um, RDU 2040, that series, if you want something that looks uh, like a more traditional radio. They have great speakers. They're very loud, work great. There's the Kenwood 2-watt series is compatible. Uh, if you're looking for something lower price, there's uh, Ocean um, KG-S84B and KG-S86B that are compatible right out of the box. And those are like more traditional radio as far as the way they look and work. And our next one comes from James, and he's inquiring about the Ocean KGUV8H. Uh, and we mentioned uh, some time back that it was our recommended dual band handheld amateur radio. And James wants to know, in 2024, is this your still recommended HT, or has it been replaced with the KGQ10H? And that's from James. Well, the, the Q10H is our recommended quad band handheld. <laughs> so um, uh, I like the Q10H better than the UV8H. It's, um, the interface has been updated mm -hmm. somewhat. So all, the, the Q10H is a very new radio. So it has the latest and greatest. Um, everything we've learned over the last few years, the, the KGUV8H has been around for probably uh, four years now. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the way the menu works, the feature names, the, the performance is great on uh, the 8H, uh, but we've changed some things around in the way that these radios work, That and those aren't in the 8. Mm -hmm. And more user interface type stuff, and um, some of the features that we would put in it now aren't there. For example, the 935G Plus is the GMRS version of that 8H hardware. Mm -hmm. And it's it's got a better radio feel than the 8H. But the 8H is still a very good radio. I like them both myself. I, I like the Q10 better, mm -hmm. personally. And our last one comes from b -Trek. And b -Trek wants to know, I am considering upgrading my mobile to the KG-1000G+. I like the reviews and features for the most part. One con I have seen is the brightness is not adjustable and is quite offensive at night. I was wondering if the mounting location would mitigate said brightness. I can see a top of dash mount being an issue, but my intended mount location is in center under dash. Would that location still be offensive as far as brightness? Thanks. And that's from b -Trek. It does. Uh, it really depends on uh, your tolerance, I guess. I mean, we sell a lot of KG-1000Gs and um, lots of people have them mounted in their vehicles and um, are completely fine with the way it looks. You, now you can turn off the display illumination entirely. Um, uh, the, I believe that uh, in standby mode, you can have the light completely off altogether. So you can run it in that mode if you prefer. Um, but it, it just depends on what your tolerance level is. Because there's, there's a lot of people that are fine with it the mm -hmm. way it, it is now. And uh, many different mount locations. So it's it's hard for me to say whether you would find it offensive or not. All right. Well, I guess that does it for our comments and questions in this episode. Send in your comments and questions for Danny or myself to show at buy2wayradios.com. If you want to know more about today's topic or about two-way radios in general, check out our forum discussions at twowayradioforum.com. You can subscribe to the Two-Way Radio Show directly from our website at twowayradioshow.com or hear it on Apple Podcasts, Blueberry.com, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or podcastindex.org. You can also subscribe by email. Click subscribe by email on the Two-Way Radio Show podcast page at twowayradioshow.com. Enter your email address and you'll get the latest episode of the Two-Way Radio Show as soon as it's released. Today's show is sponsored by buytwowayradios.com. Whether you're searching for two-way radios for general consumer or business use, Buy Two Way Radios can help you find the best solution for your needs. Give us a call at 1-800-584-1445 or enter our live chat at buytwowayradios.com. Well, everyone, thanks for listening. And until next time, for the Two-Way Radio Show, I'm Rick Savoya. And I'm Danny Feimster. And we're out. Out.